Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Thomas Costello. He is a PhD candidate at Emory University. Certain personality traits, thinking styles and worldviews give rise to maladaptive political attitudes and behaviors such as violence, extreme partisanship and authoritarianism. And those are the kinds of things Thomas studies and we're going to talk about them today. So Thomas, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So going back to the introduction and talking about maladaptive political attitudes and behaviors, what does that mean exactly? When is a, when is a political attitude or behavior maladaptive? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I go back and forth on that, that choice of word, particularly maladaptive. It's something that's that's borrowed from the personality disorders literature. So if you're uh, very low on agreeableness or, or low on uh, you're not very conscientious. Um, that's sometimes referred to uh, as as maladaptive, um, and in the, in the same way, um, and for the same reasons, I would argue, namely that uh, you're harming yourself or other people if you're very high on authoritarianism or dogmatism or something like that. Um, I I would say that that that's that's maladaptive, but but um, I can understand why why some would take uh, umbrage with with that word choice. <laughs> Yeah, and it's yeah. good that I asked you because it could be biologically maladaptive or something like right. that, but it's it's in terms of personality, mostly. Yes, yeah, that's right. So it's not it's not so much um, about uh, increasing your uh, chance of uh, passing on your 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 genes or, or reproducing or, or the species continuing on. More more about uh, causing harm. Yeah. Right. But are there political attitudes or behavior that fall under the rubric of pathology? Can we call them pathologies? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. Um, the, the study of authoritarianism originally came about in, in the 50s, and, and the way it was first described was as a syndrome, in the same way that, uh, you know, diseases are sometimes syndromes, and uh, some personality disorders, again, are, can be syndromes. Um, and the field has sort of moved away from thinking about it that way. Um, but I do think that there are a lot of parallels. Um, so, so, yeah. Okay. But, uh, I mean, and since we're focusing, I guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong on personality traits, what are the traits that distinguish people from the right, from people from the left the most? Yeah. Yeah, um, this is something that is an ongoing discussion within psychology. The, the going conceptualization describes conservatism as, or the right wing, as uh, people who are disposed to upholding the status quo and traditions and who are uh, psychologically motivated to desire certainty in their environment and who, who are threat sensitive. The, these are all things that sort of uh, coalesce, that form a constellation of traits that can be kind of thought of as conservatism. So in psychology, not so much in terms of the ideology, but in terms of the psychology of it. And and the opposite pole of that is the, the left wing spectrum. Um, I don't really agree with that way of describing it. I think it's probably much more complicated than that. Um, so for example, um, a lot of people describe themselves as a uh, as socially liberal or fiscally conservative um, right. or, vice, or vice versa. Um, and one thing I found in my research and others have found this too is that if you look at the psychological characteristics associated with uh, social conservatism and uh, uh, economic conservatism, uh, oftentimes, A, the, the characteristics are not correlated with one another. So there's different things predicting those, those uh, ideologies. And more than that, sometimes they're even negatively correlated. So sometimes the psychological need for certainty that predicts, say, like liking traditions and, and uh, traditional moral values, that kind of thing, the opposite uh, that, that, that same psychological characteristic in some cases predicts left-wing economic ideological preferences. Um, and so what that tells us is that the left-right political spectrum is not necessarily 
psychologically natural. It's not stemming from this core disposition that we have. People aren't innately left or right in terms of their psychology. Um, and, and so I think that will be a big uh, point of interest in the field in the next 10 or so years is really drilling into what exactly is happening when people are saying, I believe these things, I, I don't believe, believe these things. Um, in terms of political philosophies, the left-right spectrum is a little different, um, but uh, but in terms of psychology, that that's how I would describe describe it. So, I mean, and I think this is work done by Jonathan Haidt and others, and I'm not getting specifically into the moral foundations theory, but in terms mm -hmm. of personality, I've heard several times people saying that. Uh, in terms of the big five, what distinguishes people from the left from people from the right uh, is that leftists tend to be more open to experience and more agreeable and right-wing people tend to score higher in conscientiousness. I mean, is that right or not? Um, I, I, it is isn't. it isn't. Um... So the openness is really the big one that people fall back on a lot. And historically, it's, it's in the literature, it's been the largest predictor of left versus right, uh, with, with people on the left being more open to new experiences and uh, higher on art, like things like art appreciation and, and uh, com being comfortable with less conventional things and people and circumstances. Um, but more recent meta-analyses suggest that this effect is really pretty small. It's only about R equals Point one, point one five, um, and that's without separating social from economic. And then there's also some work, some longitudinal work, where they've they've measured <clears throat> people's personality traits and and their ideologies and see how they change together over time. And what they find is is the effect of of openness on ideology is very small. And and a very recent paper, shoot, I forget who the authors are, um, but I can I I can maybe send it to you to put in the link. Um, just found that they're mutually causing each other to, to, to a very small extent. So openness is, is, is maybe causing left-wing ideology, but also people who, for, say, environmental reasons, are, are identifying as liberal or left-wing, that is actually making them more open in a very small way. And so it's, uh, it's nuanced, and the effects really aren't that big. And so when people talk about how personality is predicting this Again, this kind of broadband left-right spectrum, I think, yes, that's true to an extent, but it's really much more complicated than that. There, there's more nuance there that I think uh, will have more answers for us than just saying the left is more open, the right is more conscientiousness, and so on. So apart from personality traits, are there any other kinds of psychological traits that predict someone being right-wing or left-wing? Yeah, there's sort of a, a milieu. There are uh, cognitive styles and thinking styles and um, mo motivations, um, which motivations and personality traits are sort of wrapped up together. But they, they have been the motivations are a, sort of a separate category of things. And um, I, also things like like threat sensitivity and like affective responses, morals, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, it's it's the sort of thing or my suspicion is. Um, that it's the sort of thing where there are a lot of small uh, predictors, almost in the same way that uh, genes have very minute effects individually on on a phenotype, um, but collectively they have a larger effect. And I think it's kind of the same thing with psychological characteristics. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's get now into authoritarianism. What is it? Sure. <laughs> well, yeah, that is that is the question. I argue that it is broader than... Is, is typically understood in the field. So, so the, the going conceptualization of authoritarianism is a co-variation of these three traits. Um, conventionalism, which is uh, being very strictly uh, adherent to socially conservative philosophies and morals, essentially. Um, uh, aggression, which is uh, kind of kicking down at people below you in the status hierarchy and, and defending the status quo against threats. And then submission, which is like this obsequiousness and bowing down and like, oh, yes, whatever you say to to people who are perceived as higher up than you. Um, but I'm not sure that really maps on to how, say, like most people in the general public would describe an authoritarian person. 
like if you just ask them. Um, I think that's probably a bit too narrow and specific to a, a certain kind of authoritarian, namely right-wing authoritarian. Um, and so I, I, we, me and uh, some colleagues put out a paper uh, recently using a, uh, the same approach that was used to come to this conceptualization of right-wing authoritarianism, actually a, a, bit, a, a slightly more complicated version of that approach, to, to do the same thing from the ground up for left. Um, and I guess we'll talk about that in a minute. But to answer your question about how I would define authoritarianism itself, I think a good place to start is that it is fundamentally about forcefully coercing other people to think and behave in ways that you want them to. And to, to really like take drastic steps to make that happen. So be willing to like manipulate, hurt, you know, use institutional authority to really uh, make other people think and act and see the world the way that you see it. And, and that, that's how I would describe authoritarianism. So what are then the distinction, the disti what, the, what is then the distinction between authoritarianism on the right and the left? Yeah. Um, the, the primary distinction that I've, I've been able, that I can tell thus far, is that authoritarians on the right generally like to protect the establishment. They, they defer to the socio-cultural authority. And that is a generalization and it's not always true, but broadly speaking, in America, that's generally true. Um, especially when the authorities are, are uh, branded as, as conservative. Um, Left-wing authoritarians in the United States and other Western democratic countries um, or countries with that, like in, within that, that fall under the broad heading of that, um, want to overthrow the establishment violently and by force using coercion. Um, that's the main difference. In terms of their psychological characteristics, they're actually quite similar, although there are also some differences there. Uh, so, for example, we found that left-wing authoritarians are uh, a little higher on uh, emotionality or, or neuroticism, which, which sounds... <laughs> like pejorative, but really it's, it just means that they are more sensitive to negative emotional experiences. Um, and uh, right-wing authoritarians are less likely to believe in science. Um, Left-wing authoritarians seem to have a higher need for chaos, uh, you know, getting, uh, uh, right. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Um, left, right-wing authoritarians were, were more cognitively rigid and dogmatic, um, but, which is not to say that left-wing authoritarians were not. Um, but, but this is something that I'm actively exploring in my ongoing work too. So I'm sure there are more differences, but the, just because the left-wing authoritarianism, uh, work is so new, um, we're still sort of discovering what, what makes them similar and what makes them different. Mm -hmm. But in terms of cognitive features, you mentioned, for example, cognitive rigidity, are there any other distinctions there in terms of cognition that you know of? Yeah. Um, so the... The work in political psychology on cognitive rigidity, need for cognitive closure, uh, kind of closed-mindedness, inflexibility, they, it, oftentimes it, it, it blurs the lines between distinct things. And one way to break it up is to, you, you can think of cognitive or rigidity broadly uh, as having a few different domains. So there's the cognitive inflexibility, which is like what people who have ADHD are very bad at like changing, uh, changing um, their focus on, on a moment's notice or adopting other perspectives when you're really locks, locked in, being able to process many different things happening very quickly. Um, and and uh, it's really about your cognitive architecture. It's, it's sort of what's going on un under the hood of, of your, your thinking. It's not something that you're privy to um, in the same way. And, and then so you have that, and then you have the second domain, which is motivations, which is things like need for cognitive closure, which is liking your environment to be black and white, having certainty in your environment, um, feeling assured and like you know what's going on. Um, and that is something that you are privy to um, and is and that is fairly distinct from your cognitive architecture. Um, so those are two domains. The third is uh, like decision making and thinking styles. So um, some people like to go with their gut and are more intuitive. Others are more deliberative and sort of uh, it's the system one, system two distinction that Daniel Kahneman makes. Um, and then finally, there's ideological rigidity, um, which is like how likely are you to change your views when you're faced with new information, which is sometimes called dogmatism. 
Um, and, and the political psychology literature, I think, sort of blurs the lines between these. Um, what we looked at in that left-wing authoritarianism paper was uh, need for cognitive closure and dogmat which the motivation and, and dogmatism and the thinking styles. Um, and we found, if I'm remembering correctly, <laughs> that the right-wing authoritarians tended to be higher on dogmatism, um, but left-wing authoritarians were also high. Um, there were not too many differences on the thinking styles, and then there was a slight difference in terms of the, the motivations. Um, we didn't administer any uh, tests of cognitive inflexibility, um, and that's because those typically, to, to measure them comprehensively, require like a, uh, a more uh, behavioral systematic experiment. Or, or lab paradigm, although that is something that I'm working on right now, so stay tuned. So in a year, we'll have more information about that. Okay, great. Maybe you can come back on the show in a year. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned motivations at a certain point there. Are there beliefs and motivational values that go associated with authoritarianism? Yeah, um, this is, I think, one place where the jury is still out about the difference between right and left. Um, so the motivations associated with right-wing authoritarianism are fairly well known, well established. Um, they're, the, they're the motivations that, that uh, go along with uh, belief in a dangerous world, um, so wanting things to be safe and secure, um, and belief that the world is kind of a competitive jungle. Um, and that you need to dominate people and get on top of them. And, and so you're motivated to uh, find safety and to be in control and, and have power and that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's true for left-wing authoritarianism too. Um, but there are also things that are unique to left-wing authoritarianism that will be interesting to explore. So um, it seems to me that left-wing authoritarians are more interested in uh, solving the world's problems. Um, I, in, my, in my personal experience, this isn't something I've, I've done scientific work on, but maybe I will going forward. Um, oftentimes, people who are authoritarian and with left-wing beliefs are sort of uh, uh, idealists that were disappointed or, or feel that the progress is not happening quickly enough. Um, and so they're willing to resort to like these more drastic measures to make that happen. Um, and so the motivations associated with that kind of process may be different from those that we know go with right-wing authoritarianism. I'm not really sure, ultimately, though. So I think it's it's something that, that uh, the field will, will be looking at soon. Mm -hmm. yeah. So from a psychological perspective, how should we classify authoritarianism? Is it, for example, a personality trait, or is that not the best way of thinking about it? Yeah. Um, it is a constellation of characteristics, um, some of which are personality traits, some of which are motivations, some of which seem to be cognitive styles. Um, it is something that is, it's almost like a recognizable uh, uh, heuristic that we use in, in our lives of, of this particular combination of traits makes an authoritarian, and that's dangerous, and that's something we should watch out for. Um, it could be that that, that constellation of traits are, have a shared cause. It could be that they don't. And, and that's one, that distinction is something that will help us determine whether the motivations across left and right are the same. So if left-wing authoritarians and right-wing authoritarians look the same and have the same or a very similar constellation of traits, um, that doesn't necessarily mean their left-wing and right-wing authoritarianism are caused by the same thing, um, because th that constellation could be coming from different directions. But if it if if the the constellation has this shared root, say in genetics, that like that can be traced to the, to you know if it's very strongly heritable and and that kind of thing, um, then it becomes more likely that left and right will will really have this shared psychological core that we can distill down. Um, so. I think it's not strictly a personality trait. It's not strictly something else. It's it's a it's sort of a, a, a yeah a constellation of, of, of different things. Mm -hmm. How is it related to social dominance orientation? 
Yeah. Um, authoritarianism was first described using a kind of clunky metaphor that nonetheless is effective, which is as someone riding a bicycle, um, because it involves bowing down to people you perceive as above you, or bowing up, rather, to people you perceive as above you, so like a bike rider kind of is hunched over, and kicking down at people below you, which would be like the pedals. Um, and so the bowing down is the submission to authority, the right-wing right, w right -wing authoritarianism on the right, um, and the kicking down, bowing up and kicking down, the kicking down is the social dominance orientation or the dominance, the power-related features of authoritarianism. Um, so social dominance is quite overlapping with authoritarianism, and they may even be the same thing. Um, even though that's that's not how. So this is something that that uh, a scholar named John Duckett proposed and really fleshed out this dual process model of authoritarianism, where it involves both dominance and submission, both right wing authoritarianism, which confusingly is not is only one part of authoritarianism. And then the other half of it is the social dominance orientation. And those are the dual processes. Um, and and we use that model as a partial in, inspiration for developing our model of left wing authoritarianism. So we weren't only uh, studying submission aspects of left wing authoritarianism. We were also building in the dominance. So so LWA has power related features and uh, aggression to those below you and um, overlaps in terms of its psychological correlates with social dominance orientation as much as it does with right wing authoritarianism. Um, so so social dominance orientation, while it's studied as a distinct thing related to hierarchies and, and motivations, I, I think in many respects it's it's sort of part and parcel with authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. Is authoritarianism related to beliefs about free will and determinism? Yeah. Um, so this was this was one question um, I became interested in, kind of thinking about how different uh, totalitarian regimes. Uh, described their goals and, and what they did. Um, and Karl Popper has written about this too. Um, uh, in a book called The, the Poverty of Historicism, um, which, which is a good book. Um, but so for example, if we think about Nazi Germany, um, they wanted to uh, create human beings via these evil you know, measures of social engineering uh, th that were predictable in their characteristics. They, they were genetic determinists. They thought you could engineer human beings to behave and act in a, in a certain way. And, and that's what they sought to do to, to, to create this, this uh, sort of Aryan utopia, uh, perfect world. Um, that's a, that's quite a deterministic approach. And, and um, in a similar way, if we look at like the Stalinist Soviet Union, um, and the idea of dialectical materialism, which which involves uh, f pulling out historical laws that we can then use to create, like understand what's going to happen in the future and build our society accordingly, um, that's that's an equally determinist uh, worldview. And these were things that really sat at the core of, say, Nazi Germany and the Stalinist Soviet Union. And they're, they're sort of different flavors of determinism, but they're, I think, both they are determinism nonetheless. Um, and so to look at this, I uh, administered a battery of different measures of authoritarianism and social dominance orientation and all the psychological characteristics that are typically thought to underlie those things, as well as a, a, a fairly comprehensive measure of beliefs in determinism across several samples with, I think, around a total of, of 20,000 people. Um, and we found that... Um, both right-wing authoritarianism and social dominance orientation fairly strongly predicted determinism beliefs, both genetic determinism beliefs and uh, what, what are sometimes called fatalistic determinism beliefs, which is sort of a confusing name. But, but what that really means is the belief that, uh, that a higher power or fate or some like mystical force is crafting world events and what will happen to you and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and and uh, so what that what that indicated to us was that there seems to be some meaningful pattern of covariance 
uh, between determinism beliefs and authoritarianism. And because that's consistent with our observations from like history and, and philosophy, um, I think that, that, that can be used to tell us, uh, to hint at what is really going on in terms of the why people are authoritarian, why people adopt deterministic beliefs. Um, namely that they want certainty. They, they want to see things in black and white. They want to know what's going to happen. And uh, determinism provides an answer for that. Authoritarianism provides an answer for that and saying, just trust me, just trust our belief system. We know we're right. Don't worry about what other people are saying. Don't worry about the nuance. We're just going to do it because we know we're right and it's easy and here you go. Um, and and uh, so that could be what is, what is going on there. Yeah. So why is it that left-wing authoritarianism has been traditionally neglected in the political psychology, perhaps political science literature? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think it's I think it's a few different things. I think part of it is that when this topic was first being studied, it was right after World War II. The the most prominent example of authoritarianism and totalitarianism at that time was obviously the Nazis and fascism. Yeah. Um, and so the very influential seminal foundational work in this field was really designed to understand the specific manifestation of psychological authoritarianism that that leads to fascism, which later became right-wing authoritarianism. Um, I think that's understandable, um, but it sort of had this side effect of defining left-wing authoritarianism out of existence before people had a chance to really start studying it. Um, in the same way that, so I, me I mentioned ADHD earlier, that um, when that uh, diagnosis was first being developed, they, on they only, they based the diagnostic crit criteria in the, in the DSM on studies of boys exclusively. So there weren't any girls in the sample, in the subject pool. And so the symptom criteria for meeting, like meeting the diagnostic criteria for ADHD was biased to finding ADHD in boys because they, they didn't include symptoms that were more common in girls. And uh, 50 years after that, now there's sort of like, oh, wait, there are these sex differences in ADHD, or are they actually sex differences? Or have we just sort of like not been incorporating symptoms of girls with ADHD into our diagnostic criteria? Are we missing the larger part of what ADHD is? And that seems to be what's happening in the field. And in the same way, uh, this has happened with the authoritarianism literature. So, uh, by only focusing on the facets of authoritarianism that are most present in the right wing side of things, we've sort of incorporated this asymmetry into our understanding of the construct. Um, and so that's one reason why I think it hasn't been studied. Left wing authoritarianism hasn't been studied as much as right wing authoritarianism. That's one. Two is that. Yeah, I think it makes some people uncomfortable or it's just not what they would want or choose to study just because most psychologists tend to be politically liberal or, or left further left than liberal. Um, and so that, you know, I think the thinking is like, oh, well, why would I study that when I can study other things that are, that are interesting? Um, and, and so it's sort of been left alone for a while. Um, not entirely, but, but, uh, right-wing authoritarianism is much, much more heavily studied than left-wing authoritarianism. Um, the reason that I was interested in it was was sort of the, what I just said about uh, us not being able to get the whole picture of authoritarianism unless we get both left and right. Um, so I actually think it's quite important to study. Um, but the uh, I think the political bent of the field has had some effect. I don't think it's the whole reason that people haven't really focused on left-wing authoritarianism because it is true that, uh, especially in like the last 20 years, there's been there's been a growing body of work on left-wing authoritarianism. Um, and of course, you can also find it much more readily in post-communist uh, countries like like former Soviet bloc countries. Um, that's sort of an interesting case though because. There, the the tradition, the thing that might provide safety and and certainty, 
is communism. Um, so people who want to preserve the status quo, who might be right-wing authoritarians in, say, the United States or, or, or wherever else, um, in those post-communist countries may sometimes be left-wing authoritarians um, because they also want to preserve the status quo. So studying those people may not tell us quite as much about what authoritarianism is as studying different conceptualizations of left-wing authoritarianism, such as left-wing authoritarianism, like authoritarianism and people who want to overthrow the government rather than preserve it. Um, so that's kind of like a, a, a little quirk in that, in that literature. Um, and then, and then I think a third reason is that um, left-wing authoritarianism probably isn't quite as prevalent as right-wing authoritarianism is in these Western democratic countries. I think there are probably fewer people who want, who are so coerced, like determined to coercively, violently overthrow the government that, 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 like that authoritarians who want to overthrow the government, revolutionary authoritarians, I think there are fewer of them than there are right-wing authoritarians. And, and so it has seemed less pressing to study right-wing, to left, study left-wing authoritarianism. Um, so between those three things, um, you get to this point where there's this huge asymmetry in the literature um, that does not really map on to reality. Um, so, yeah. But is authoritarianism more prevalent on one side of the political aisle than the other? Yeah, um, that is an open question. I think it could be, but... I would imagine that if you generalize across the globe, it gets pretty similar. Um, but I'm not aware of data that really is able to arbitrate between the different possibilities. Um, as I think, I think there's a real similarity to to what we have talked about with the left-right political spectrum more broadly, where it mm -hmm. gets really nuanced. I think that is also true of left versus right wing authoritarianism, authoritarianism across the political spectrum. So I think the answer is to really drill down into it. And to answer the question of left right asymmetries, what we will really ultimately need is a, a model of authoritarianism that isn't specific to left or right, that captures the traits of left as well as it does of right. And, and only then can we really compare. Um, and and uh, that would, is, I would say, the foremost, the issue of greatest importance in the authoritarianism literature right now is we need as a field, as political psychologists, to come to a consensus about what generalized authoritarianism is. How can we pull out the traits from left and from right to develop something that describes both sets of people? Um, that will allow us to answer all sorts of interesting and important questions, especially given that authoritarianism is on the rise, like a dramatic rise around around the globe, as, as we see not only from the news, um, but an organization uh, called Freedom House puts out a Freedom in the World report every year. And I think it's something like 17, 18 consecutive years that authoritarianism has been on the rise in the majority of countries, um, and freedom has been on the decline. And uh, that includes... Uh, also, like, you know, as heterogeneous as the nations of the world are, authoritarianism is in the rise in, in that heterogeneous group of countries. And so uh, that's obviously a huge problem. And, and uh, when we're only looking at one side of the picture, um, when we're only studying ADHD in boys, that doesn't really allow us to diagnose the, the, the real problem. Yeah. So now for the last part of the interview, let's change topics completely because okay. you also study sexual objectification. Uh, yeah. What is it? Yes. Oh, um, so sexual objectification involves uh, dehumanizing, uh, seeing other people as the sum of their sexual body parts and sexual worth, essentially. Um, so um, reducing people to their value as a sex object, hence objectification. And are there people that are more prone to doing it than others? And is it a case of personality traits or not? 
Yeah. Um, uh, personality disorder traits, like psychopathic traits, uh, being very mean and cold hearted, um, and impulsive, um, and, uh, not having a very wide emotional range, having very little empathy. Uh, these are all things that predict objectification of other people, um, both in terms of your attitudes and your perceptions of other people. Um, so viewing other people as objects, but, but that also translates to behaviors. So, um, harassing people at work, uh, you know, catcalling, um, those sorts of things. Um, and we, what, one, one interesting thing with that work is that, uh, it seems to be equal, uh, it seems to be more predictive of objectification among women than among men, which is not to say that, um, it's not strongly predictive among men, it being these dark sort of psychopath, the really psychopathy related traits. Um, but they're stronger predictors in women. Um, one reason for that may be that there are, are more uh, social barriers to objectification among women, so it's less acceptable. And so to really get over that barrier of like, okay, well, I'm going to be rampantly objectifying people, you have to be higher on psychopathy or meanness or whatever the whatever the case may be than you would be uh, if you were if you were a modestly psychopathic man. So. So, but there are sex differences in sexual objectification or not? Yes. So men do it much more than women. Um, but women who are, who do it are much more psychopathic than the men who do it. Okay. And, and that's all. I, there are no other, I mean, yeah. no other traits that. Oh yeah. Be... So, so there are, I mean, well, so this is the thing with, with personality disorders. Um, and, and maladaptive personality traits, there, there's a great deal of overlap between, between them. So uh, the very lowest spectrum of agreeableness, you know, antagonism, uh, really far out, that is essentially lots of different components of psychopathy. So if you have the low agreeableness, you're going to be predicting a whole lot of variance in psychopathy in, in, uh, uh, Anti in the uh, other personality disorder traits, um, and so there, there, there's this whole spectrum of traits that predicts objectification. Really, whatever kind of dark or bad trait you can think of <laughs> predicts it. Um, and uh, it's so, yeah, it's not, it's not just psychopathy. But these are more prevalent in men than women. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. By, by the way, just one last question. I don't know if this sounds weird or not, but is there any connection between this topic and your work on politics? I mean, does that connect in any way? Oh, yeah. No, it's a good question. I mean, I, it does It does indirectly. Um, I started out studying psychopathy and personality disorders, and so my work on this has it's been an outcropping of that. Um, but in many respects, authoritarianism involves dehumanization, dehumanization and of other people and uh, objectification, not sexual objectification, mind you, but objectification. So seeing other people as tools or instruments that you can use to accomplish your goals. Um, instrumentality is sometimes called. And um, so if we look at like genocide, um, that is going to involve objectification and dehumanization. Um, and many of the traits that dispose to objectification also dispose to authoritarianism. Um, so I do think that there, there's a, a connection there, even if it's indirect. Okay, so uh, where can people find your work on the internet? Sure, uh, I, have, I have a website. Uh, it's thcostello, C-O-S-T-E-L-L-O dot com. I also have a Google Scholar page. I think if you just Google my name and then psychology or politics, uh, some, some page or other will come up um, and you'll be able to find it there. Okay, great. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and I hope to have you again in the year then yeah. when your new work is out. So. Sure. Sounds good. I, I would love that. Thank you. Thanks so much.
Hi guys, thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Enrique Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windega, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, Jorge Espinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Des Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, My Producers, Isar Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafini, Akion Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardes France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.